In today's video, I want to tell you a story. A story of a young girl who was on the verge of becoming an adult and who had a bright and exciting future ahead of her. A girl who had hopes and dreams, a loving family who she was close to, a beautiful close-knit rural village to call her home in which she had gotten her first job working in the local village post office and general store. And there was a boy. A boy who she loved with all of her heart and who had asked her to marry him and spend the rest of their lives together. That girl's name was Brenda Evans and on October the 7th, 1977, her hopes, dreams and exciting future came to a sudden and violent end when someone decided to take her life. If you blink as you're travelling down the A483 between Chester and Wrexham in the northwest of England, you're likely to miss the small village of Poulton, which sits on the England-Wales border. It's one of those places you'd never bother to glance at if you're in a hurry. The drive from Chester takes you across some of the flattest scenery around, scattered with farms, isolated houses and open fields. People living or passing through Poulton in October 1977 would have come across activity that would have surprised the unsuspecting. Police cars were parked by local farms, frogmen were marching up lanes and names were being taken from anyone who ventured into the area. The villagers of Pulford and Poulton were being subjected to a full-scale murder hunt for it was this quiet backwater of Cheshire that 17-year-old Brenda Evans was found brutally murdered in the afternoon of Friday the 7th of October. Crime of any sort, particularly back in the 70s, was virtually unknown in either of the two villages linked by a physical joint parish council. Back then most people in the area worked on the land. Dairy farming was the main money earner for most of the villagers, with many of the farms owned by the Duke of Westminster. The Duke's historic presence dominated the villages. The family once owned their own brickworks in the area, and a lot of the buildings in the area still to this day have the same characteristic red brick structure. Many of the walls have the letter W picked out in black brick alongside the red. The local publican said for most of the year the two villages are quiet places. What village activity there is is centred on the village hall on the main road which stages traditional events such as jumble sales, hot pot suppers and dances. Poulton, the village where Brenda lived, has little attraction to outside visitors apart from its typical Cheshire beauty. There were no pubs, no shops and no central point. It did, however, have a lot of farm buildings and a lover's lane, which is a plain roadway built during the Second World War. The lane, which acted as a shortcut for those that were inclined, was known in the village as a popular spot for courting couples. It was along there that Brenda's body was found. Brenda Evans was a young girl who had everything to live for. Described by those who knew her as a beautiful, happy and cheerful person, she was popular but overall a quiet girl who was looking forward to marrying her childhood sweetheart John and making their first home together, which had been promised to them by John's boss. Brenda was close to her family. She lived with her parents Harry and Betty and her older sister Eilis. She had gotten a job in the general store section of the local village post office as an assistant. Her boss, Samuel Roberts, described Brenda as a very neat, tidy and pleasant girl who was very easy to get on with. When she took on the job at the post office, she quickly became someone that the village took to and had great affection for. She was trustworthy and very promising in her work. As part of her working day, she would walk the 700 yards from work to go and have lunch with her aunt and uncle, Violet and Selwyn Davis. Brenda set out about her usual routine. She went to work at the post office in the morning and on her lunch break she walked the short distance to her aunt and uncle's house. Saying goodbye to her aunt and uncle, 
Brenda set off after lunch to make the 10 minute walk back to work. Her uncle, Selwyn Davis, watched her stroll along Gold Lane on the left hand side until the hedge hid her from sight. It would be the last time he would see her alive. Brenda's father, Harry, who as usual arrived at the post office around 6pm to pick up his daughter from work. He was surprised to find that she wasn't there. Postmaster Samuel Roberts explained he assumed that she must have taken ill when she didn't return from her lunch break. Harry stated, I couldn't believe it when they said she had not returned home from dinner. Brenda's parents and neighbours from the village began frantically searching. John Pritchard, Brenda's fiancé had been working all day cutting hedges in a nearby farmer's field. As soon as news reached him of Brenda's disappearance, he ran home to tell his mother Edith that her future daughter-in-law was missing, and they quickly joined the search. Hours later, it was Edith who discovered the body of Brenda, lying deep in a watery manhole behind a derelict hut in the woods leading to a disused brickwork drainage system in a lonely country lane of Poulton. Her body was partially submerged in water. Recalling the moment she discovered Brenda's body, Edith Pritchard said, I ran out in my slippers to go and look along the lane. I went to the hut because around there is one of my favourite spots for blackberrying. There was nothing in the hut and I went around the back of it and looked down the manhole. I could see something blue with buttons on it. I shouted, come on love, I'll get you out but I couldn't do anything. Police later revealed that Brenda's body was half submerged in water, about six feet down the shaft. She was partially clothed and other items of her clothing were strewn nearby. The contents of her handbag, however, were undisturbed. She had been brutally attacked and strangled to death by her own tight. As is the standard practice when there's been a murder, police started looking at those close to the victim and Brenda's fiancé John Pritchard was taken in for questioning. John went with the police not yet knowing that Brenda was dead, but his suspicions were aroused when a detective radioed ahead and asked for the gates to be opened. He was referring to the gates leading to a cell block where John was taken to a detention room and questioned about his movements. Speaking of that day, John said, I asked them what was up and they told me in a very matter-of-fact way that Brenda had been murdered. When someone tells you flatly, she's dead, you just can't take it in. I couldn't accept that she wouldn't be around anymore. That was the beginning of a 27-hour ordeal in which John had just a wooden bench to sleep on and was given only one meal and a cup of tea two hours before he was released. What hurts a lot is that I keep telling them I'd never hurt her and I got very upset because no one would believe me. They questioned me for three hours, then one would come in and ask me if I knew Brenda had another boyfriend. Then he'd go away and let me think about it. Then they'd leave me with another little thought, trying to wear me down. Later they apologised for the lies, and I knew they were only doing their job, but being an outdoor lad, it was hell being locked in that room. 
I started counting the bricks and doing other things to occupy my mind. Even now I remember that it was 28 bricks along and 17 high. It was a terrible experience, but in a way, I am grateful. I know that when they catch the bloke and get him in that room, he'll crack. Harry Evans, Brenda's father, said, I went to pick her up from the post office at about six o'clock and I could not believe it when they said she had not returned in the afternoon. She had been for dinner as usual at her aunt's home, ten minutes walk away from the post office. She had not got an enemy in the world. Brenda's Aunt Violet said that her niece had walked as usual to their home for lunch and left on foot around one fifty. Brenda was happy and cheerful as usual, looking forward to getting married next year. She would not have taken a lift with anyone. If she had gone in a car, she would have been talked into it. Speaking of Brenda's relationship with John, a friend of the couple said, They met at the local junior school and they have been together for as long as we can remember. Brenda was a lovely girl. Everyone feels shattered by what has happened. In the days following Brenda's murder, police began interviewing workmen who had been laying new water mains for the last few weeks. An incident room was set up in the Cheshire Police Headquarters. A Home Office pathologist was called in and police dogs joined the search for clues as to what happened. CID made house-to-house inquiries and divers from Cheshire Constabulary Underwater Search Unit were called to explore the 24-foot deep shaft at the disused pump station at Poulton, near the spot where Brenda's body was found. Officers using metal detectors scoured the surrounding thicket which had been cut back to ground level to enable them to look for clues, particularly blood-stained clothing as police revealed that Brenda had been badly beaten around her face and head. This must have been even more heartbreakingly difficult for Brenda's father, Harry, who was the one to identify his daughter's body. Reverend Canon Skipper, the rector of Eccleston and Pulford, spent much of the weekend with Brenda's parents and sister at their home. They are surrounded with family and friends in a way that is vital for them at this time, he said. They had taken such care in bringing Brenda and her sister up and in seeing that they understood how to conduct themselves. He also said that Brenda's engagement to 20-year-old John Pritchard had surprised nobody. Everyone knew he was the boy for her. They both had so much to look forward to, he said. Police revealed that a local woman had come forward who saw Brenda walking to work in Old Lane minutes before she met her killer. The woman was driving along Old Lane towards the Chester Wrexham Road when she saw a dark blue car driving in the opposite direction. Superintendent Roy Suckley said, We are now concentrating attention on finding the owner of a dark blue Mark II type Cortina. Police had questioned every resident in the neighbouring villages of Pulford and Poulton. Roy Suckley said, It could well be that someone in the local community knows something they are not telling us. Brenda might have known her killer, or he could be someone who had carefully studied her movements and knew where she would be walking along Old Lane. Exactly a week after the murder, police staged a reconstruction of Brenda's last walk. WPC Denise Piggott left the home of Brenda's aunt and uncle, Springfield Cottage, Old Lane, Pulford, at 1.50pm, the same time Brenda left to make the short walk to work at her job at Pulford Post Office. Miss Piggott made the walk dressed in similar clothes Brenda was wearing that day. A blue nylon overcoat, white polo necked sweater, blue knee length skirt, blue and white overall, tan coloured tights and beige sandals. The villages of Pulford and Poulton were cleared for the reconstruction, with witnesses taken up where they were a week ago. On the 24th of October 1977, Pulford and Poulton came to a standstill as Brenda was laid to rest. Villagers packed into St Mary's Church, where Brenda and her fiancé had planned to marry the following September. The whole village turned up in force to pay their last respects. Brenda's fiancé, John, had to be supported by relatives as he followed the coffin to the grave, where he placed three love tokens to be buried with Brenda. A large teddy bear, her engagement ring and a small spray of flowers. The teddy bear was a Christmas present he had given to her, and the gold ring with three small diamonds that he had given Brenda when he asked her to marry him the previous May. Brenda's father Harry said, I don't think John could bear to keep these things which brought back memories of the happy days they had together. 
It was his wish that they should be buried with her, together with his flowers. Nothing can bring Brenda back but the kindness that we have been shown since the start of this terrible ordeal will never be forgotten. Murder squad detectives mingled with mourners in the Pax St Mary's church as their investigations were failing to find the person who had killed Brenda. As Reverend Canon Skipper conducted the service, he said, This savage crime has left a shadow of fear, bewilderment and shame on the village. As time went on and no new leads were presenting themselves, police activity in the villages of Pulford and Poulton began to lessen and life started to continue as it ordinarily would have for most. However, the loss and grief was incredibly difficult for Brenda's family and also hurtful rumours of who could have done such a thing to their daughter. Edith Pritchard, Brenda's mother-in-law-to-be, spoke of the strain on her and her son John following Brenda's death. I have been receiving treatment from the doctor because I haven't been sleeping well. I seem to be a bundle of nerves. The police think it's very suspicious that I found the body and they keep questioning me and making me go over my story. This past month has been a nightmare for both John and me. He has been very brave and has been a great comfort to me throughout. Brenda's mum, Betty Evans, spoke out for the first time to address the hurtful gossip. I'm fighting to get used to the idea that Brenda won't be coming again, and I'm fighting to lead a normal life for Eilis's sake, but she keeps reading all these things in the newspapers. It's very upsetting to have it all brought back to us, and I want little Brenda to be able to rest in peace. Those who loved her won't forget her, so there is no need for the rumour mongers to keep talking. They should stop now because they are also upsetting John. They loved one another, and he has gone through so much. The people doing all the talking have lost sight of what we are having to endure. If they have anything to say, it should be to the police. That would be more helpful than making our lives a misery. That misery meant sleepless nights for Betty. In the weeks since Brenda's death, she had only twice taken the tablets her doctor prescribed. When I'm feeling low, I add a little whiskey to my tea and it helps, she said. I can always put out whiskey, but I'm scared I could become dependent on tablets. We've started the business of moving to another house. I always lived in the country, and it will be so different for us, but I just cannot go on passing those woods every day. They will always haunt me. Brenda's parents and her sister Eilis moved away from Pulford soon after. With no new leads and no further evidence to go on, the police activity around the case dried up and the case became cold. It remains that way to this day. In March 1984, seven years after his daughter's murder, Harry Evans passed away at the age of 53. He died without ever seeing his daughter's killer brought to justice. A review into the case was opened in 2011. With advances in forensics, police often take another look at all the evidence. However, no outcome was given. It's been 46 years to the day of uploading this video that Brenda Evans was murdered and she has become quite a big name in the paranormal and exploring communities. The rumours which upset her family so much at the time of the murder are still going strong to this day, 46 years later, claiming that an unrelated derelict bungalow was Brenda's aunt and uncle's house, that Brenda was murdered in the bungalow and that it was even Brenda's own father who raped and murdered her. The car the police were so keen to track down during their investigations was never found and everyone who was questioned didn't ever result in any arrests. Nobody knows the truth about what happened to Brenda that day, but hopefully advancing technology will one day uncover the truth. Today, the lettering on Brenda's gravestone is starting to fade, but you can just about make out the engraving. It reads, In memory of Brenda Evans, age 17, dearly loved daughter of Harry and Betty, and sister of Eilis. Her sweet life will long be remembered in this village. <laughs>